Hey guys, welcome back. It's Lucky here, and today we're gonna go over the Stamina Arcanist. The newest class added to the game is the Arcanist, or the Arcanist, however you want to say it. This class is really fun, really powerful, and it's just a good, good time. Like, I've really enjoyed my time on it, especially in solo content. It's so tanky, it does so much damage. And so in this video, I'm gonna explain what we did to become an absolute beast of a tank, an absolute beast of a DPS, all in one package, you know? We get to do it all and we get to have fun doing it, and we get to look good doing it, and it's got a great sound design to it as well. Like, I just can't recommend enough giving this class a playthrough and trying it out. There will be footage on the screen of me playing through Vodashron Hollows on Veteran with the build so you can see what the playstyle looks like. So without wasting any more time, let's jump into the build itself. As always, there's a written guide linked down in the description below. I highly recommend you check that out for all of the little details on the build. And also it's just real easy to follow. We put a lot of work into that. Take advantage of it. Next for the Mundus, while soloing, we're gonna take the Lover Mundus. While in a group, we're gonna take the Thief Mundus, all right? But the Lover is gonna give us that penetration that we so, so need in the game not in real life but in the game right so we're gonna take that and we've got attributes we're gonna put all 64 points into stamina for the most amount of damage possible the more stamina you have the more damage you do it's a formula right it's there so we're gonna pump our main stat as high as we can so that we get that damage multiplier as high as we can then for the consumables, we're going to use Lava Foot Soup. This is going to give us 5,000 more stamina and about 500 more stamina regen. So more damage and more sustain so that we don't run out of, you know, stamina while we're killing everything. If you feel like your health's a little low, you could take a little less stamina and a little less sustain and use Dubious Cameron Throne, which will give you a little more health instead of those things, right? So it's a nice alternative if you feel like you're a little bit, you know, a little bit light on health. But this build is incredibly tanky because of all the passives that are at play. So, you know, give it a try before you decide you're super squishy. All right, now let's get into the gear. I'm going to give you three loadouts for this build. As always, I'm going to give you one for those of you that don't have access to any DLC content. This is also going to be your starter build, the one you start with. It's real easy to get this gear. And then I'm going to give you gear that can be obtained in the dungeons. And then finally, if you want to go into a trial and get a trial loadout, I will give you the gear options for that as well. So for the non-DLC loadout, I'm going to recommend that you take Venomous Smite on the body and you're going to take Order's Wrath for the front bar and back bar weapons as well as your jewelry. This is kind of your starter loadout and you can turn that back bar into a Maelstrom Staff if you ever get that DLC. If you don't have it though, then just go ahead and put Order's Wrath on the back bar as well. All of these pieces of gear can be bought at any guild trader. For the monster set on your head and shoulder, I'm going to go ahead and recommend Ice Heart if you don't have the Ring of the Pell Order. If you do get the Ring of the Pell Order, then it's really nice to take the extra sustain from the Magma Incarnate set. Instead, it gives you a line of Stam regen and a line of Mag regen, which can be really nice for this build if you need it. If you don't need that extra sustain, you can take damage instead and go with Slime Craw on the shoulder. For the dungeon loadout, what we're going to do is put Deadly on the jewelry and weapons in the front bar. We're going to put Maelstrom two-hander on the back bar, and we're going to put Pillar of Nern on the body. Now, if you already have Pillar of the Nern weapons and jewelry, go ahead and put it on the weapons and jewelry. Or if you already have Deadly on the body, like it really doesn't matter which is which. It's a very small difference in damage, so you can put Deadly on the body if that's easier for you. But if you haven't farmed Pillar of Nern, it's pretty easy to get the body pieces. It can be a pain to get the weapons and jewelry, so feel free to put Pillar of Nern on the body for this build. That's fine. For the monster set, again, you can take Magma Incarnate or the extra resource regen, or you can take Slime Craw for the extra DPS. At low CP, you might want to take the Magma Incarnate. Gamble for the shoulder at the Undaunted. You don't even have to run the dungeon. You just gamble for it with your five keys. Get it? Slap it on your shoulder. You get that extra regen, which is really nice when you're low level or low CP and your sustain is really rough. And then, of course, you're going to run the Ring of the Pell Order on one of your ring slots, and that's going to give you tons and tons of life back as you deal damage. This build does tons of damage over time either from your channeled beam or from your dots, right? And so that ring of the bell order means like, if you watch the video, my life hardly ever moves away from full. And if it does, it bounces right back to full because of the ring of the bell order and a couple of our other skills that we have going here. As for the trial loadout, if you want, you could go ahead and put Coral Riptide on the body and pair that with Deadly. 
it's not really going to result in much of a damage increase, especially if your stamina is not going low on you. Like if you're not getting your stamina down to around 30% on a regular basis, it might even perform worse. So this is one of those builds where running the dungeon loadout might actually be the best thing for you. It might be the best performer. So feel free to stop at the dungeon loadout and ignore trial gear altogether. I know a lot of you are going to be really sad that you don't have to go into a trial and farm gear for this one. All right, next, let's go over the skills that make this build tick. It's a little bit bit different from anything else in ESO. So if you've never played the Arcanist before, then just go ahead and listen and kind of try to take note of especially how crux are built up and how they're spent. That's probably the most complicated part of the build. And it's really not that complicated other than like the first time you're hearing about it before actually trying it. Okay, so don't be scared. First skill that we have is called Escalating Rune Blades. This is our spammable. It's also our crux generator. It's a really nice, it's a really satisfying spammable because it throws three projectiles at the target, doing really good damage. Boom, boom, boom. And then that third one hits and does AOE damage. So it does good single target damage and then a nice little bit of cleave at the end as your single target spammable. So it's always nice when your single target spammable also has a little bit of cleave built in. It just makes sure that it always feels good regardless of the scenario you're in. That's also generating your crux, right? And then next ability is going to be Tentacular Dread. This is one of the two abilities that we're going to be using to consume our crux. So we want three crux and then we want to use this ability. And the reason is this is a massive rectangular attack, right? Tentacles go out in front of you 15 meters by five meters wide. Very nice big area. It's also going to put the Abyssal Ink debuff on the enemy. And what this does is it means you do 5% increased damage to the enemies that it hits. And if it consumes Crux, it adds 2% per Crux consumed. So there's three Crux. That's 6% increased damage from your Crux, 5% from the skill for a total of 11% increased damage to that enemy for the next 20 seconds. So you want to get your Crux up and unload this on the enemy as soon as possible because that's a free 11% increase in damage from all your abilities to that enemy. Next, we've got Barbed Trap. Barbed Trap, if you've put a build together before or followed a build before, you've probably seen Barb Trap. It's been good for a long time. It's still really good. This skill is one of the best single target dots in the game. It's also one of the best buffs in the game, giving you minor force, which gives you 10% increased critical damage. And it's also giving you those fighter skill buffs, which are going to give you 3% weapon and spell damage per fighter skilled ability slotted and increased ult regen per enemy killed. Huge, huge skill. All of that coming from one little skill. So we use it. We take advantage of it even still. Next, we have a recuperative treatise. This is kind of a really cool ability. Also, this thing costs a ton of magicka. So be careful. You do not want to overcast this, but it lasts a long time. A full 30 seconds, this buff, right? This is going to cause you to explode in damage. So you're going to radiate damage. Also, whenever you use one of your class abilities on an enemy, it's going to add onto that ability 4,700 damage so it's buffing your class abilities while this is on you so it's a buff and it's also going to restore 600 magicka and stamina and regenerate crux if you have none so this ability is going to be great because it's going to regenerate crux it's going to buff you it's going to give you more resource sustain it's going to cause your class abilities to do more damage right it's doing all of that but it is expensive and it costs 4,366 Magicka. If you overcast it, you will run out of Magicka. So make sure you don't do that. Next, we have Pragmatic Fate Carver. This is our other Crux Spender, right? So we've got two Crux Generators that we've talked about so far. One is Escalating Rune Blades and then two Recuperative Treatise will generate a Crux, but only if you have none, right? So it could give you that first one getting you up to one crux and then we have a third crux generator we'll go over in a second so pragmatic fate cover this is going to consume your crux what does this do it shoots a long beam think dragon ball z goku kamehameha right boom you shoot that out in front of you 22 meters really big area in front of you for absolutely stunning damage especially if you pair it up with consuming three crux. Why? Because it does increase of 33% damage per crux consumed. So you have three crux, that's basically right, 99% increased damage, almost double damage. On top of that, it costs 16% less per crux spent. So it's cutting the cost by 48%. Really, really big cost reduction, really big damage increase. So you always wanna make sure you have three crux before you use this. You always wanna make sure you have three crux before you use your tentacular dread. And that's it. That's the only time you have to worry about crux. 
The rest of the build doesn't really worry about it. Some of the skills are passively generating crux for you. Sometimes you have to manually do it with your rune blades. You're constantly going to be generating crux. I want to emphasize that if you play this class and you don't even think about the crux, right? You don't even think about it because playing the class is hard enough. You just play it. If the crux that you naturally regenerate and the crux that you naturally spend will be plenty to play this class really well and to play it really powerfully. Even if you didn't think about the crux system at all, you'll still be able to do all the solo content in this game no problem okay so don't stress about the crux system especially at first maybe just play the class maybe just work on getting your dots down your buffs up and you know using your dps abilities the best that you can and then once you get kind of comfortable with that start paying attention to the crux that are floating around your character is there one or is there three if there's not three then you know cast your rune blades a couple times before using that dread if there's not three cast your rune blades a couple times before using your pragmatic fate carver right and it's going to really amp up the damage of that ability and it's really fun next we've got flawless dawnbreaker flawless dawnbreaker is another fighter skilled ability ESO lets you slot an ultimate on the front and the back bar. So you get two ultimates, but only one is going to be the best, right? And we only need to use one. So we use one as a bar buffer and we use one to actually do damage. So we put Flawless Dawnbreaker on the front bar to look pretty and to make this bar do more damage, basically, because it's got the fighter skilled passives, which are going to cause this whole bar to do 3% extra weapon and spell damage and, you know, that extra ult regen. Right, so we're getting to double dip into the uh, weapon and spell damage. So because we have two fighter skill abilities, we got 6% increased weapon and spell damage just because those abilities are there buffing this whole bar all the time. Next, we've got the back bar. OK, so we've got Stampede, which is one of the most fun abilities in the game. It's also one of the most powerful abilities in the game, especially when you pair it with the Maelstrom two handed great sword, because what this ability does by itself is you stampede, right? It's a gap closer. It stampedes toward the enemy, smacks them, placing a fat dot on them and all the enemies around them. Nice big AOE dot. Then if you have the Maelstrom Greatsword, it adds another bleed dot on top of that, right? So you've got your massive dot from this uh, attack. Then you've got another massive dot from your two handed greatsword. Next, we've got Carve. Carve is a conal, like a cone in front of you of damage. Attached to that is a little bit of shield that so if you hit an enemy with it or if you don't, you get a shield and it applies a massive dot to the enemies. This skill is really unique because it adds 10 seconds to its duration every time you cast it before it falls off. So it's one of the very few abilities where I will say you need to cast this ability again before it falls off. You need to make sure when there's like one or two seconds left, you have to cast it again because that'll end 10 seconds to the duration of the next cast. So the first time you use it, it's going to last 12 seconds. But if you cast it again when there's one second left or two seconds left, it'll have a 22 second duration. And if you cast it again, when it gets down to like one or two seconds, it'll have a 32 second duration. And that's where it caps out. It'll be 32 seconds every time after that, if you keep it up, which is a really long time for a dot that hits this hard. That's going to save you a ton of resources if you can maintain it and turn this into a 32 second dot like that. Next, we have resolving vigor. This is a really cool skill because it's doing a couple things for us, right? It's giving us minor resolve, giving us 3000 resistances, which is going to pair really nice with all of our damage mitigation on this build. We've also also got a 20,000 health heal over five seconds, which is monstrous. Basically, if you pop this ability dodge roll, by the time you stand up again, you'll be full health and ready to annihilate the enemy that scared you for that brief moment. Next, we've got Crux Weaver Armor. This is a really cool ability for a few reasons. Let's get into it. It's going to give you major resolve. It's going to increase your resistances by 6,000. That's huge. So you're going to take way less damage because of that. It's also going to apply minor breach to any enemy that hits you. So that's 3,000 extra penetration against them. So you're taking less damage. They're taking more damage. And if an enemy dares to hit you, it's going to generate one crux every five seconds. So this is another reason why if you're not really paying attention to your crux, you're constantly generating them. This is one of the abilities that is constantly bringing crux in so that you can spend less time generating it manually with rune blades and more time beaming, which feels really, really good, right? So your recuperative treatise is generating crux and your rune blades will be what manually generates crux if you're shy by one or two when you need to cast dread or fate carver. Next, we have Fulminating Rune. This is going to put an explosive rune under the enemy that does 20,000 damage or so over 20 seconds. The rune's also going to linger there for six seconds before exploding. So it's more like 26,000 damage over 20 seconds on buff, right? So it's a really, really solid dot. And it's partially an AOE ability too, which just feels good. 
right? Just a nice class ability. Plus, because we have it slotted, we're dipping into some class passives, so we'll talk about in a moment. And then next we have the Tide King's Gaze. The Tide King's Gaze tears open fabric and basically summons an eye over the enemy's head that's gonna shoot a laser beam from the eyeball down onto the enemy, melting them. And if it kills the enemy or you kill the enemy, it'll automatically switch targets to the next thing nearby. Feels really good, looks really cool. And so we're gonna take advantage of that. Now for the rotation of this build. The rotation's pretty straightforward, but also if you've never played an Arcanist before, it's also gonna be a little bit foreign. So let's talk about it. The first thing you're gonna do in any rotation is pre-buff, right? That means you're gonna use any skill that you can that's not going to cause aggro on the enemy. So we're gonna buff ourselves with our Recuperative Treatise. We're going to buff ourselves with our Crux Weaver Armor. Now we have those buffs on and now it's time to start placing the dots down. So I like to just keep it simple. We're going to go stampede into them. Then we're going to throw a carb on them. Then we're going to throw our fulminating rune down, right? So just go through the back bar skills that aren't down yet. Then go to the front bar, throw your barb trap on the enemy. And now all of your dots are ticking. All your buffs are up. It's time to unload on them, right? So if you don't have three crux yet, go ahead and use your escalating rune blade one time, maybe two, but it's probably only going to be needed once. And then you're going to use tentacular dread. This is going to debuff them, making you do 11% more damage to them for whatever you do next. What you do next is definitely going to be uh, a couple more rune blades. And then boom, you're going to unload your primary source of damage, your pragmatic fate carver. This build is built to make this skill do tons and tons of damage. If you've got multiple enemies in front of you, this will melt them, right? Everything that we do in this build is in service to the skill, our gear, our passives, our skills. It's all to make this do more damage and it works. It does a lot of damage. It melts the enemies. So because this Tentacular Dread is a 20 second debuff, you'll probably have time to do your Rune Blades a couple more times and then one more Fate Carver before starting the cycle over again. And that's basically the rotation. So you'll do that whole thing, you'll pre-buff, you'll throw your dots down, and then you'll do your Dread, then you'll do your Fate Carver, making sure to have three Crux before you do each of those, and then you'll probably have time to get another three Crux and do another Fate Carver before that Dread falls off, and you need to reapply the dots and your Dread and go at it again. All right, now let's go over the passives for the Arcanist, all right? First up, we have Faded Fortune. Faded Fortune is going to cause you to have increased critical damage and healing by 12% for seven seconds every time you generate or consume a Crux. So basically 100% uptime on a 12% crit damage buff. That's huge. That's a very powerful buff. Next, we have increased Quintessence. When you restore magic or stamina, increase your weapon and spell damage by 5% for 10 seconds. Well, we're restoring magic and stamina constantly because we're using recuperative treatise, right? So we're constantly proccing this, which means we basically also get another 100% uptime on a 5% weapon and spell damage bonus. So that's two buffs that we are going to have up 100% of the time because of the way we built this build. All right, next up we have Psychic Lesion. This is going to increase damage dealt by status effects by 15% and status effect chance by 75%. So our status effects that we're going to be putting on the enemy, like our poison on our weapon, our burn on our weapon, our burn from our flame wall, right? All these status effects that we're going to be procking on the enemy already anyway are going to be doing more damage and happening more often. Finally, we have Splintered Secrets. This is going to increase your physical and spell penetration by 991 per Herald of the Tome ability slotted. We're using a lot of these abilities, which means we get a lot of extra penetration. Here on the front bar alone, we have a bonus of 3,000 penetration, right? Combined with our light armor, combined with our skills and everything like that, we have tons of penetration. Like, we're set. We don't even need to worry about getting more. We're always going to have enough penetration on this character. Plenty of it, right? Feels good, man. So we don't have to slot like a major breach when soloing, which is nice. You know, it saved. We can just put something fun there instead. Next up in the Soldier of Apocrypha skill line, we've got Aegis of the Unseen. While a beneficial Soldier of Apocrypha ability is active on you, increase your armor by almost 2,000. This is great because we always have one active. We are going to have 100% uptime on that buff because we're using Crux Weaver armor to give ourselves major resolve and to debuff enemies. So we're going to get another 2,000 armor on top of what we already have. Another reason we feel super tanking on this class. Next, we have Wellspring of the Abyss. 
This is going to increase your health, magic, and stamina recovery by 129 for each Soldier of Apocrypha ability slotted. So you get a free bonus of 129 resource regen because you have this ability slotted. Feels really good. Another reason that our sustain is super cracked on this character. Next, we have Circumvented Fate. This grants you and your group minor evasion for 20 seconds. I talked about this a little bit earlier and reduces the damage from area attacks by 10%. This effect can occur once every five seconds. So all we have to do is cast an Arcanist ability and then we proc minor evasion for 20 seconds and it can happen every once at once every five seconds, which means we have 100% uptime on this buff as well. Implacable outcome. When you consume Crux, gain four ultimate. This effect can occur every eight seconds. We are consuming and generating and consuming Crux like a madman. So we're going to proc this constantly again. Just going to help our ult regen. We're going to take it, right? Next, we have the Curative Rune Forms passives. All right, let's talk about these. Healing Tides increases your healing done by 3% for each active Crux. So, you know, if you do use a heal, sometimes you're going to do 0% extra healing. Sometimes it's going to be up to 9% extra healing based on how many crux you have. Hideous Clarity is going to cause you to restore magical or stamina, whichever is higher, every time you generate crux. Again, we're doing that constantly, which means we're constantly going to get resources back, which means we're never going to run out of them on this build. Next, we have Erudition. Erudition is going to give you increased magicka and stamina recovery by 18%. Even more sustain will take it. And you're definitely going to feel that on this class. You're going to feel tanky and you're going to feel like you have great sustain and you're going to feel like you have good damage. It's just going to be a lot of fun to play. Next, we have intricate rune forms. If you have a curative rune form ability slotted, it's going to increase your strength of your damage shields by 10%. So if you use one of these abilities, you'll get that passive. If you don't, you won't, which isn't a big deal because you don't really need that. Next, we're going to grab the dual wield passives. Why? Because they're going to make us do more damage. And we're going to have better sustain and more damage and better sustain and more damage. So we're going to take it. But the main reason and the main one we want to look at here is Twin Blade and Blunt. This is the reason you use the weapon you use when you're dual wielding. Like if a build calls for mace or if it calls for daggers, it's this passive. This passive says for each dagger we wear, we get increased critical chance of 812. So 1600 increased critical chance. That's massive. So we're going to rock two daggers on the front bar. If you want to use a staff on the front bar on this build, go ahead that's going to be totally fine it's going to work just great it'll do a little bit less damage but you know you'll get to pew pew with your staff at range instead of having to smack them with your daggers but you know how eso is you're going to end up in melee range for 99 percent of fights anyway either the enemy is going to close the gap on you or you're going to close the gap on them and for the back bar we are going to use a staff we're going to use a staff because of the nice AOE damage and the great sustain that it's going to give us. And we're going to take all of these passives because they're going to increase our damage and our sustain with a staff. Next, we're going to grab all of the light armor passives. This is going to increase your penetration. It's going to increase your crit chance. It's going to do a lot of things for your character. It's going to increase your sustain. It's going to reduce the cost of abilities that cost magicka, right? Your armor passives are really, really, really important. Don't skimp out on them. Get them soon as you can. If you're wearing light armor, get all your light armor passives. If you're wearing medium armor, get all your medium armor passives. And we are going to be wearing all light armor and a piece of medium on the body. So grab those medium armor passives as well, because that's going to increase your crit damage. It's going to increase increase your ability to sneak. It's going to reduce the cost of stamina abilities, right? Again, really good. You can skip heavy armor because we're not wearing any. Next up, fighter skill passives. We touched on these a little bit earlier, but these are important because they're going to do things like intimidating presence is going to reduce the cost of the abilities by 15%. So it's good for your sustain. Slayer is going to increase your weapon and spell damage by 3%. For each fighter skilled ability slotted, we always have one or two fighter skilled abilities slotted, which means you're going to have between three and six percent increased weapon and spell damage just for slotting the abilities, not even using them, just for putting them on the bar. You get more damage. It's great. And the next up, Banish the Wicked is going to regenerate three ultimate per enemy killed. This one doesn't stack. So if you wear two fighter skilled abilities, you don't get six ult regen. It's still three, right? So for this one, it's just important that you have one fighter skilled ability slotted, whereas for Slayer, it does stack for each ability you have slotted. And then finally, Skilled Tracker is going to increase the damage of the fighter skilled abilities that you have slotted by 10% when you use them. Great. Next, we're going to grab Undaunted Passives. You're going to grab both of these. These are going to increase your resource pool sizes, and it's also going to give you resources back when you take synergies, your own or somebody else's, right? If you grab a synergy, it's going to give you resources back. So that's always nice and crucial for your sustain and group content. Next up, we're going to take our racial passives. These are usually pretty powerful. And if you pick the race that's relevant to your build type, like a mag build or a sand build, you pick the right race, you're going to have some really powerful passives in there. Next, uh, well, last but not least, we're going to take Alchemy's 
medicinal use. This is going to increase your potions duration. So your potions by default last for 35 seconds. And if you get this, they last 47 seconds. The potion cooldown is 45 seconds. So that means your potions can last two seconds longer than the cooldown if you max out this passive. If you don't invest in this passive, then you have approximately a 25% downtime on potions which is huge when you consider how much potions are increasing your damage. Next up, we have champion points. I'm going to put those in the written guide that's going to be linked down in the description below. It's just so much easier to just go down a list and invest them than have me sit here and read that list off to you. And it's a great guide. It's a you know, we put a lot of work into those written guides, so definitely, you know, take advantage of it. And that's everything for this build, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, if you learned something, please consider giving it a like and a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm and getting this video in front of more people. I appreciate it. And a massive shout out to my YouTube members for supporting the channel in the big way that you do. If you want to become a YouTube member for perks like behind the scenes footage, access to a private Discord channel, and always having my ear, click the link down in the description below on how to become a member. For everyone else, thanks for watching guys. And if you're not sure what to do next, maybe check out one of my other guides popping up on screen right now.